Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, we have just had uh, the honor to hear from His Highness Sheikh uh, Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani about the extraordinary role Qatar is playing and his vision for Qatar. But besides the role uh, Qatar is playing in the fields of politics, diplomacy, energy supply, there is one other element which is so important. It is Qatar's role in international sports. And it is, as we have already heard from His Highness, it is the first time that the World Cup is hosted in the Arab world. And it's a truly important moment for the region and the entire world. It is in this spirit that we are hosting the following session with an extraordinary panel to celebrate the power of sports as a unifying force. It is now my great privilege to introduce His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani to opening this very special sports-related but also peace-related session. Please join me in welcoming His Highness. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today in Davos. It's my first participation in the World Economic Forum, and in a year that is very special to Qatar, as we are going to host the 2022 FIFA World Cup. The tournament, this tournament, will be the first major sport event with full attendance after the devastating pandemic. I'm happy that we will unite the world and bring people back together again. It is also the first time that the Arab world will host such a mega event. Our region has suffered for so long. Hosting the World Cup will give hope to the youth across the region and making the lasting contribution to the world. The impact of sp such sport event is not limited to fun, but goes far beyond that, to achieve mutual understanding between different cultures and different backgrounds. The people of Qatar and the region are excited to showcase our hospitality and the ancient culture of the Arab world. The Qatar 2022 FIFA World Cup is a journey of hard work determination, and tireless effort. I'm looking forward to welcoming you all in Qatar later this year. I wish the best for all teams participating. And uh, we have one of the best goalkeepers in the world, Mendy here, and he's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna be uh, playing against my national team, so I spoke to him earlier, I told him that, you know, I hope he's not going to be in the best shape during that game. <laughs> Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, His Highness. And uh, it's such a great honor to have you with us and thank you for those uh, encouraging words. We, we had a brief discussion earlier and uh, Mandy, who is uh, one of the best goalkeepers said, he's gonna play very hard, but of course we want Qatar to proceed and do well. President Kagame, so wonderful to see you. So good to see you. And also a special thanks to uh, Klaus and the World Economic Forum for providing this platform. Th this is a, a relaxed, easy session, and uh, we're gonna keep it as informal as possible. 
the, the approximately November, December this year, five billion people worldwide will be watching the Qatar FIFA World Cup 2022. It's, it's a great privilege and a great honor for not only for the Middle East, but I can tell you for the developing world and, and for football all over the world that uh, the World Cup is coming to Qatar. We cannot think of a better place or a better personification. His Highness, uh, you spoke about trust and uh, you have built under your visionary leadership so much compassion, so much love for people, not only in the region, but worldwide. And, and we are immensely grateful. And this is gonna be the best FIFA World Cup ever. We've got no doubt about that. The other issue is that football has shown us over many years in a very unique way that it brings people together from different language groups, different races, different religious backgrounds, it, it has served as a unifying force. I was in Nigeria last week to hand over the Confederations Cup and uh, the leadership there, both in football and in, uh, uh, in government was saying when the national team of Nigeria plays, all of the ethnic backgrounds becomes one united Nigerian come together. All of the religious backgrounds unite because in those 90 minutes, the Nigerian national team represents the best of Nigeria. I've heard the same being said in Cote d'Ivoire and I've heard the same in many parts of the world. We also know that when, uh, if you talk about a different sport, when Pakistan and India play cricket, for that time, we've been told over and over again, the, the soldiers on both sides, both Pakistan and India stop, and, and they watch cricket. They watch sport. So sport brings people together, and of course, uh, football is unique and, and has played the greatest role in uniting people across the board. So we're gonna start, and one of the things we're going to do is to also recognize the, the fundamental contribution of football to the socio-economic upliftment. I mean, every time I'm in Qatar, I see thousands of people from all over the world having the privilege and the excitement of employment and taking money home uh, with the building of the stadiums, the building of the hotels, the, the, the benefits and the impacts of the World Cup in Qatar far surpasses the huge infrastructure that's taking place in Qatar, but it has huge benefits for our people in the Middle East as well as worldwide. So uh, we are now going to start with uh, the president. I mean, there's a whole, we've got a world-class team here, and uh, I don't need to take too much time introducing them except to say that we have uh, uh, the president of, of uh, FIFA, the president of football worldwide, Gianni Infantino. I mean, you've done exceptional work since you've taken over to focus on making sure that, that the respect, the ethics, the credibility in, in football all over the world, as well as in FIFA, is, is uh, reinstated. And you've done excellent work, keep up that work. Ronaldo, who's called the phenomena, has won the World Cup twice and scored a huge amount of goals during all World Cups. And one of the exciting things is football inspires young boys and girls all over the world, not only to become like Ronaldo, like Mendy, but also to use the success and the inspiration of those football stars to pursue their talents, whether it's to become a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, but it's the inspiration from football players like yourself, Ronaldo, and others is, is exceptional. And then, of course, we've got one of the most successful women coaches in the world who's won the World Cup twice, 
uh, America is doing very, very well. I'm told that at some stage the men will become as good as the women, but you know, the women are uh, leaps and bounds ahead and we wish the men all of the best and we're very proud of Jill Ellis and the work she does. And of course, uh, you can clap hands for it, it's fine. Okay. And then uh, Hassan Al-Tawadi, wonderful work in being the spokesperson, very eloquent, very inspiring, and the good work that you've done as the leader of the local organizing committee. We're very proud and you've done good work. And we're gonna be, Qatar is gonna show the world uh, not only the beauty of the heart of the Qatar people, but also the power of football to unite people from different backgrounds, different continents, because the world needs unity. Edward Mendy, I had to give him the, the gold medal for being champions of Africa and uh, made us so proud. He's the, currently the best goalkeeper in the world and uh, inspires hundreds of millions of young people. Of course, many of them from Africa, but worldwide. And I did comment and say, of course, you know, as the president of Africa, I want him to do well. But, uh, and we want all African teams and all teams to do well, well throughout the world. We also want Qatar to keep on uh, doing well. So, uh, you know, follow the rules and everything. And uh, I wish you all of the best. Arsene Wenger, uh, I don't need to say much of, about Arsene. Brilliant football brain, but also an incredible person. And uh, his commitment to football development and the role he plays in FIFA is outstanding. I'm going to start with you, Gianni. You are, you are the president of FIFA, and FIFA is the biggest and the most influential sport organization in the world. And uh, part of the issues today is to talk about football as a force for good. Football as a force for good. The immense positive contributions of football. And, uh, and as I said earlier, the unique role of football to, to unite people, different languages, different cultures, different races, and, and, and encourage young people. Tell us about uh, how you see the, the Football World Cup, the Qatar uh, showcasing of the best and the highest level of competition of football in the world. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Patrice, and, and let me first of all uh, thank as well uh, Professor Schwab for uh, allowing, uh, for having FIFA and uh, the world of football here at the World Economic Forum. It is a great honor for uh, our 211 member countries, more than the United Nations, our over 300 million of active players and billions of uh, football fans all over the world to be represented here at this uh, very prestigious stage. Um, well, you know, Mandela was saying that sport can change the world, that it can inspire, that it unites, and definitely he was, he was right with that. And football as the most popular sport in the world has a unique reach. The last World Cup was uh, watched by 4 billion people. The last Women's World Cup by 1.2 billion people. This World Cup in Qatar will be watched by 5 billion people, way above half of the world population. And um, all these people who follow and pursue the same passion, um, they all feel in the same way, and they all know that football has this uniting force. And there are many examples in history. We speak about the World Cup. Let's look a little bit back. 2002, Japan and, and uh, Korea together jointly organizing the first World Cup in Asia. In 2006, a united Germany as well, welcoming the worlds, as they were saying, amongst friends. This was their slogan. Uh, well, South Africa, 2010, united the whole of Africa in pride of organizing such uh, uh, an incredible event. The World Cup in a few months in, in Qatar, the first World Cup in the Arab world, will be the best, best World Cup ever, uniting the Arab world, but uniting as well the entire world in the Arab world, which is so important, and His Highness, the Emir mentioned it earlier, it's so important in these particular times. And even if we look 
forward a couple of years ago when there were discussions about building a wall between Mexico and the United States, well, Mexico and the United States together and together with Canada decided to work jointly to put a bid to organize jointly the World Cup. This is only football can do it. And football can do much more. I would just like to mention um, gender equality, empowerment of uh, women and the role of football in this respect, which is, which is uh, quite unique. Thanks to the perseverance that was mentioned earlier as well, we managed to obtain, for example, that uh, women in Iran can go and attend football games. This was not the case for 40 years. Now, will this change anything? Well, maybe, maybe not, but many, many women in Iran are happy about that. In Sudan, in Saudi Arabia, there are women league, there are women national team now playing football. Um, as well as well as I see Sheikh Mohammed here, uh, thanks to the help of Qatar, we have been able uh, to, or they have been able, and we have contributed a little bit to evacuate many people from Afghanistan, including a lot of women who were playing football in Afghanistan. And these kind of messages are, are incredible. And you said it, football unites when the national team is playing, and we'll see it at the World Cup, the whole country is behind that national team. I always remember uh, George Weah, one of the best players in the world, who now is the head of state of Liberia, saying that when they were playing with the national team of Liberia and there was war, uh, you know, the, the war would even stop and people would unite behind the colors of the national team. Football is definitely a force for good. Thank you so much, Gianni. Uh, Ronaldo, phenomenal. I mean, you, you won the World Cup twice, I mean, I've seen you play beautiful football. In fact, many of the best players in the world that I have had the privilege to talk to have said that in their minds, you were and continue to be the best football player ever. So we're happy that you are here. But can you talk, tell us about uh, the World Cup and, uh, and the power of the World Cup in, in the world today? Um. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I will try in English. So, you, as you say, it's a relaxed meeting. <laughs> so, I try in English. <laughs> Should be good. Should be enough. <laughs> well, um, my history with World Cup starts, and uh, I was 60, six years old in 1982, the World Cup in Spain was my first uh, World Cup watch on TV, uh, and we lost again <laughs> against Italy. I think it was the last time we lost against, against Italy. <laughs> I <think so> too. <laughs> and uh, I was inspired by Brazilian players. Zico, my idol, played for Flamengo. And I was completely uh, uh, inspired by him. And uh, I was thinking about to be a football player and whatever it cost. So uh, I had so many opportunities to become a football player. And against my mom and my father that said, you have to go to school. And I, well, until 15 years old, I, I, I went to school, but after that I became so famous that I couldn't study in the school. I was only taking picture and uh, I was already famous at 15 years old at Cruzeiro. And uh, against my mom and my father, and I, I gave everything to to become a football player. And um, and until today, I thank the all the generation before me that they start to inspire people. They inspire me, and um, I, today I see when I see Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi, and Ibra, Mbappe. Uh, Neymar, and they all was inspired by me. Really? So, 
I think I did a, a great job. <laughs> and uh, the story with uh, the World Cup is, is, is amazing. All Brazilian dream to, to, to go uh, play for, for the national team, to win a World Cup with Brazilian. We all dream about that. But it's not that easy. Only 23 players go, you know, and millions of other people doesn't go to World Cup. But uh, still, they keep love of football, keep watch football, and uh, keep being inspired by football. Is that uh, I think uh, the power, as President Gianni said, we have so many power. In, in our hands that we have to use it more and better and better and every day better. We have to touch everybody's heart through football that we can do a better world. And uh, World Cup is that, you know, it's the time when everybody share the same bar the same table, the same restaurant, the same stadium, of course, to 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 join to enjoy the the, the, the World Cup. I think it, the message of World Cup is very very strong, and we need to to send it to more people as Absolutely. we can. Absolutely, thank you. We can clap hands for him. He's inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Muito obrigado, Ronaldo. I mean, Jill, uh, you won the World Cup twice, one of the best coaches in America. Where do you see women's football uh, developing? How is it developing and growing in America and globally? Well, I, I think, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and maybe I start with this and say an investment in women's football is an investment in women. So I am uh, privileged to be here and advocate, continue to advocate uh, for women's football, and I'm proud to be to be sitting up here. But the women's game is is exponentially uh, rising. I mean, we've seen it. Uh, we've seen it in the number of fans we see in seats. We've seen record-breaking numbers in club football and in international football. We see it in sponsorship, uh, the investment with dollars, and the backing and support of, of major brands. And we also, the most important thing, we see it in the numbers of participation, the numbers of little girls now going out to pick up a ball and play, and uh, it is such, such an impact. And, you know, I think what, what FIFA has committed to is a billion dollars in women's football. And I think, one, I think that's fantastic and deserves a round of applause. <laughs> but more importantly, I think it speaks about the importance of our sport that it warrants this kind of investment. Um, you know, we've seen in, in 2019, the Women's World Cup set all kinds of records. And actually, probably on the men's side, the similar thing. Every iteration of the World Cup, it betters itself. And so I'm truly excited to see what uh, Australia, New Zealand next year in 2023 holds. We've increased the number of teams to now be at 32 teams, which I think is incredible. Um, you know, we are, with, with backing and competition, we're looking to promote everything from prize money to a club world championship. Uh, I think right now we are ripe uh, to, to continue to invest and elevate our sport because again, in doing so, we're doing that for women. Um, you know, I think for me personally, uh, this, this sport has been a gift. It helped me find my voice. It helped me with a career. And, and much like Ronaldo, part of the responsibility now is to give back, is to help grow, and is help to dedicate and move the needle and move the sport forward. Um, you know, and FIFA is, is leading in that way. We are trying to bring forth reforms and hold people accountable in terms of, uh, you know, eliminating abuse in the landscape for, for young women and girls. So I'm incredibly proud. I'm incredibly optimistic. Um, I always say if you want to be a coach, you've got to always plan on winning um, because you have to have that hope. And I, I'm truly delighted and inspired by the future of, of the women's game. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Asan, the, the state of Qatar has invested billions in uh, hotels, infrastructure, 
world class, world class, and a lot of that infrastructure and uh, the, the millions, I mean, we expect about two million people to visit Qatar for the World Cup. And uh, they will come back because you've got world-class infrastructure. And, and also, as I said, just the, the, the friendliness and the compassion and the love of the people of Qatar. Now tell us about the legacy and uh, what will we do to make sure that the great work and the legacy that will ensue because of the Qatar World Cup uh, prevails for many years to come. Thank you very much, Patrice, and thank you, uh, everybody, for, for inviting me to this uh, esteemed panel. Um, I think I'd want to take back, go back 12 years. You know, from the day we submitted our bid, from the day we considered bidding, we recognized the transformative power of sports, and more importantly, of the World Cup. And what we did was we worked towards ensuring that the World Cup serves as a vehicle for the nation to achieve its overall goals. So what we did is we put uh, the Qatar National Vision 2030 plan in front of us, which is built upon the foundations of economic diver uh, diversification, environmental sustainability, human and social development. And based on that, we looked at the plans of the World Cup and how can this help achieve the nation's, uh, the nation's overall objectives. So accordingly, for example, the infrastructure that you mentioned, state-of-the-art infrastructure, when we're looking at metro systems, when we're looking at expressways, when we're looking at information technology and te telecommunication infrastructure, these were, all, these were all part of the plans uh, of the nation in terms of urban development and overall development. And what the World Cup was able to achieve was accelerate these initiatives. The investment, every investment that we looked at for the World Cup was done with beyond the World Cup in mind. So if we look at, for example, as I said, the metro system, it was part of the plan, part of the overall development plan to achieve two goals. One was reducing congestion on the streets, reducing traffic, encouraging people to use public transportation, which has a knock-on effect of re reducing carbon emissions and a carbon footprint. The World Cup allowed us to be able to achieve this in short period of time, actually world record time, state-of-the-art metro system, public transportation system. If you look at the buses, we've accelerated our investment in, elect in electric, bu electric buses and encouraging people to use public transportation. If we look at the stadiums, every stadium has a unique story behind it. Every stadium has a legacy behind it. So from the design phase, we actually incorporated legacy and post-use. Um, I'll choose two examples, two specific examples. Lucille Stadium, the, uh, the one that will be holding the final, 90,000 seats. Now the plan is beyond the World Cup. It will be utilized as bot botanical gardens and be utilized also for food security research programs as well. And then there's another stadium where, to those of you who might not be aware of it, for me it's my, my, my personal, I hope it's yours as well, Your, Your Highness, it's 974. It has a very unique story. 974 from the design was designed in a way where it's set up like Lego utilizing shipping containers, built up, and pre-designed so that by the end of the tournament, it will be disassembled. And currently, we're in discussions right now with FIFA for hopefully, uh, I won't announce it just yet, just until we finalize it, but hopefully a very ambitious goal, which will, I think, set the bar and set the standard in terms of infrastructure for stadiums that can actually be utilized beyond the tournament itself. Now, this is as far as it relates to the infrastructure. Of course, looking at the overall nation's goals, if we're looking at environmental sustainability, we made a commitment that this tournament will be carbon neutral. Uh, we've launched a number of different initiatives. As I said, in the design phase, we've committed towards uh, the highest standards in terms of procurement and construction during the construction phase. So one example is uh, um, Ahmed bin Ali Stadium, which used to be a Rayyan Stadium. It was a pre-existing stadium. What we did was we had to tear it down to, uh, to build it up to FIFA standards, but we recycled 90% of the materials into the new stadium. And the remaining 10%, we're utilizing that to promote sustainability through public arts. In terms of the actual operational models of the stadiums themselves, again, incorporated into the design, it's the, mo it's the most efficient in terms of water consumption, in terms of energy consumption, and so on. So that's one aspect when it comes to environmental sustainability. Of course, there's a number of different initiatives that we've done in accordance also in cooperation with our stakeholders. One example is, We've instigated, uh, what's it called, an 800 megawatt solar farm that will feed into the network and that will offset the carbon neutrality as well, or, or car the carbon emissions uh, from the tournament. Just one last point when it comes to carbon neutrality as well. Our commitment is not carbon neutrality of the tournament. What we've tried to do, and it's a pretty ambitious goal, we've actually captured the carbon emissions during construction as well. And we're looking to offset that. And I think 
It's very important because at, as a tournament, as major tournaments, I think there's a very, very strong uh, opportunity to showcase environmental, sustainable models that can live beyond and can have a wider impact throughout the community. Now, of course, in terms of other, uh, other elements of legacy, I'll just very briefly address uh, one very important factor, uh, which is the fact is we have always said this is an Arab World Cup. And so the initiatives that we've launched also, we've launched a number of different initiatives that extends beyond Qatar towards the Arab world and the region. So we launched, for example, Generation Amazing. Uh, it's uh, um, a program that utilizes football for development. Uh, it teaches people civic engagement skills. It teach pe teaches people leadership skills and so on. And as a result of that, we have about 750,000 beneficiaries. Some of them have been some of the Afghani refugees that have ended up in Doha for a period of time. And some of them have been actually inspired and Generation Amazing has utilized these skills. Uh, some of the people have been able to utilize it beyond uh, in, in, in their future lives. We will be launching one of the uh, stadiums, uh, one of the uh, initiatives as well in Kigali very soon in, in Rwanda as well. To summarize it, and, and I can go on and on and on, and I apologize, I always speak a lot, so I apologize for that. <laughs> but I'll summarize it as simple as this. I think every major tournament has a very powerful impact in the society. But you can, if you utilize it in the right way, it can extend beyond. Absolutely. Beyond in terms of ge yeah. geography and beyond in terms of years. Yeah. And that's what we're aiming to do. Excellent. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> absolutely, I mean, quite, quite visionary. And uh, it, it helps to have uh, an, an emir who's passionate about football and, uh, and who's, who's got visionary plans for, for the state and the people. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, your highness the gentleman next to you president kagame really in africa inspires many young people because of his passion for sp football and the excellent work he's doing eduardo uh, you you are the best you, you got an award as the best fifa goalkeeper in 2021 and you inspire young football players and, and also those who don't necessarily follow football, but get inspired by your success and your inspiration and, and what you've achieved over the years. How does football impact or touch young people uh, in Africa and worldwide in terms of their socioeconomic dreams and, and upliftment? You, you can speak in French, eh? Thank you. Um, bonjour à tous. Uh, to the just so good afternoon, uh, everybody. My... Can you bring my... Uh... Oh, that's it. Uh, okay, thank you, Gianni. Uh, merci beaucoup. Continue. Thank you very much. Uh, you can continue. Thank you. So I want to say hello to everybody. I'm really honored uh, to be here uh, with all of you and uh, to answer the question I think uh, that we all know here that uh, football is a sport uh, which uh, brings together more people at any one time uh, than any other sport. Uh, so I think uh, we've all seen that. Uh, as you said, uh, we, it, football has the power uh, to transmit. Uh, to instill values uh, to in youngest people. Uh, they, they see us as an example, as a role models. Uh, and so I think that when, when you see uh, African players, or people like Mohamed Salah, Sadio Mane, who, who really play at the highest possible level. And then uh, we talk about uh, the best world players, not the best African players. And I think that uh, that uh, this is uh, what we need to focus on. So these are true examples, true role models, and uh, they give uh, hope, they're a source of hope for young people. They give them uh, the desire, they, they transmit emotions. Uh, it's football uh, which has that power, and it's the only sport that has that power. 
as uh, uh, Phenomena said, that it uh, really is uh, uh, the power of football transmitting emotions, but, and we have to take advantage of this uh, uh, to uh, convey other values as well, such as uh, work and exceeding uh, what your limits uh, and also uh, working together. It's a collective uh, uh, work around a common goal. And so I think uh, that it's uh, through all these different uh, elements uh, that football has an impact on the social level and uh, in, in all countries of the world. Thank you. It's a wonderful uh, answer. You're not just a good goalkeeper, you're also an eloquent uh, Spokesperson, it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, I was worried when Sadio Mane took the penalty for Liverpool, and you were the goalkeeper of Chelsea. I said, oh, he knows where he's going to kick the ball, yeah. and uh, you knew already. Yeah, you, you I did knew. very very well. <laughs> and he knew already. Messi beaucoup. Arsene, you joined FIFA in 2019, and uh, you've made a huge contribution to the development of football. How do you distinguish between the best and the rest? The best and the rest? <laughs> in your previous life as coach and, and uh, also in terms of your response, the leadership you have taken. Well, I would say that, uh, you know, the team, uh, first of all... I, I can't say the best and those who are not so much the best. I just say the best and the rest. So continue, Arsene. Coaching is basically to get the best out of people, you know, and uh, uh, overall I would say that uh, the players usually have a learned behavior, they play since a very young age and uh, they know what to do in the team. But after that, what you have to know is a, a, a sporting a football player need to meet his needs in the team. That means you have to be an observer and see how can he express his talent in the team? And that's why the coach is so important because he has to detect the main quality inside a player. Then you must know as well, uh, I think Ronaldo and Edouard spoke well about that, a champion is somebody who hates to stand still. So that's why you have to give him a clear picture of what is his next level. And you would be surprised how many players don't really know what they have to do to be better. And uh, then I would say as well, uh, sporting organizations are only partially focused on performance. And uh, you have to create an environment inside your club where improvement is expected. It's not something they give you, but something that is expected from them. That need, that demand from the collective environment to be, to be better, you know. And you would be surprised that that is not always the case. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Arthur. Br brilliant. Uh, brilliant answer. I mean, we learn so much from leadership uh, in football and leadership as a coach and how we trans transfer part of that leadership quality that you have to business, to government, and to organizations that we run. Thank you so much. Gianni, we spoke about the five billion people who will be watching the Qatar World Cup in November, December, and, uh, and they'll be watching football. And I spoke about uh, what we've been told in relation to cricket, when the Pakistan uh, national team and the Indian national team plays. But I, I'd like, just, just tell us, I mean, what is so special? What makes football so special? What is it about the passion, the excitement? I mean, you know, we own a football club and, uh, and my wife tells the players at times, you better win because if you don't win, my husband doesn't kiss me and <laughs> it's very miserable, so. Well, but they win quite often, actually, yeah? I wish they did. <laughs> so what is so special about football? Well, what is so special about football, I think every single one of these five billion people has probably his own answer to that, uh, to that particular question. 
Uh, but of course, if you, if you analyze it maybe a little bit more in depth, uh, you realize that football is actually quite unique. It has different, different dimensions. Uh, we are here at the World Economic Forum, so football has definitely an economic dimension. It has a social dimension as well, and then it has an emotional dimension. Uh, on, maybe on the, on the economic dimension, because it's also an important element of it, that maybe many people don't, don't know that actually. You know, the, the economy of football on a global scale has a gross output of around 200 billion a year. A gross value added of around 150 billion. It's 200 a billion year. US dollars. US dollars. Amazing. US dollars. It's like a mid sized state, right? Incredible. And uh, if you think it a bit further, you realize that 70% of that economy is done in Europe. 7 0. Now, the part of European economy in the global economy is definitely not 70%, maybe rather 17% than 70. So imagine the potential, the economic potential that there is around the world. And this will happen. And if you translate this economic potential into the social dimension of football, football changes lives, has changed the lives of many people. Those who become players, big players, bigger, bigger players, mega stars, but boys and girls who, thanks to football, uh, can live values, friendships, team spirit, and many of the other values. So the social impact is there because of the economic impact. And then the emotion, well, that's this irrational part of it. It's uh, what you cannot explain uh, when you fall in love, what you cannot explain when, uh, together with your families and friends, you cheer for, for a team uh, that maybe wins or maybe loses. And uh, uh, football has this kind of thing where that when your team loses, and that's the unique in all sports, people cry, right? People cry, countries cry, and uh, that's, quite, uh, that's quite unique, quite emotional. So I think football uh, is definitely much, much more than just a sport. Absolutely. That's well put, absolutely wonderful. Uh, Ronaldo, football transformed your life. Uh, how important is it for us to use football as a tool to unite people uh, worldwide and to, to bring people together? Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. Maybe now people don't know, maybe I have a team in Brazil called Cruzeiro and a team in Spain called uh, Valladolid. And um, we play in both country in second division, and we hope we go in first division this year. We are very close. Uh, but we have uh, uh, three uh, uh, Muslim, Muslim uh, play, Arabic players, and our top score is uh, from Israel. And where well, you can see this image, you know, when we score, they both hug each other. You, you, you cannot see this in, in the world. And we have many other examples about this. And uh, uh, our powerful football, um, we, we, we have to share. I invite my colleagues players uh, to talk about that, you know, encourage people to, you know, to change the world. We, we can do that. And football, we have enough power to do that. And we have enough example to do that, you know. And we, we will keep doing this in this way. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I, I remember I come from a, a country where when we grew up, black and white people were not allowed to play f sports together. Uh, you know, they were not allowed to be on the same field together. And, and even under apartheid, we, we saw white football players go to the townships and play in the areas which were set aside for blacks and they were embraced through football.
Yeah. And the same applied for the black football players who played in the white areas. They were embraced because football, uh, during the years of apartheid, really brought people together. And, mm. and of course, the first time South Africa won, became champions of Africa, the captain was a white football player. But for the football people, they didn't see him as a white or black. He's one of us. And it, so football has really brought people uh, in my country as well as in other parts of the world between uh, different races. Joe, uh, you are one of the most successful coaches in the world. And in relation to what I spoke, this whole concept of how do you inspire players as a coach and uh, what are the leadership skills in terms of uh, bringing out the best of players yeah. uh, in your experience and, and you know, how we can learn from that. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, whether you're coaching a team, running a country, you're, you're, man you're dealing with people. So, you know, I think what I, what I realized is to, to have a successful team, I think people need two things. They need to feel valued. They need to know that they matter, that their contribution matters. And they also need to have clarity, right? What's expected of me? What is my role? What is my job? And, you know, just to share a quick, quick story, um, I had 23 All-Stars in the 2019 World Cup. Every single player wanted to be on that pitch. Every single player was deserving. But guess what? They can't all play. So one of the things that my staff and I decided to do was, how do we show value to all of these players, even if they don't play a minute? And typically, when you put up the lineup the night before the game, you put up your starters, and then you put up your reserves or your substitutes, whatever you call them. And we decided to change that name and not call them substitutes, not call them reserves. We decided to call them game changers because they weren't there to fill in. They were there to go into the game, to make a difference, to be the difference. And suddenly showing value to them, you could see the pride they had in their role to support the starting group. And then every time I was in front of the media, I would say, they'd say, Jill, what is it going to take to win? I'd say, takes 23 our depth will help us win so again it was an opportunity for me to show value to all and you know I've just over the years working with teams if people feel that they are a part of something special and their role is important uh, great things can happen thank you so much our son uh, we're going towards the end uh, w what does the uh, World Cup mean for the people of the Arab world. And this is the first World Cup uh, uh, in that zone and in that area. And uh, the whole excitement and enthusiasm. I mean, you know, just to paint a picture, um, two very quick pictures. In 2010, two weeks before, we bit, before the final uh, vote, uh, we hosted a Brazil-Argentina match. Um, at the end of the match, of course, you know, was to host and showcase the passion that the Arab world had. Now we had people from all over the Arab world flying in for a friendly match at the time, just for a friendly match. Um, at the end of the match, I was driving back uh, home and I found a man with, with, with his son standing on the side of the street. They were looking for a cab. I picked them up and I dropped them off. Along the way, I just asked him where he was from and it turns out he was a, a father from Oman. He promised his son if he passed his exams, that he was actually going to get him tickets to attend the Brazil-Argentina match. <laughs> now, in that conversation, you could see what, what it meant, what it meant for the, for, the, for the son, the excitement to actually attend a friendly match, and the excitement, what it meant also for the father and the son, that bonding, to be able to come and attend this match. And you can extrapolate that towards the World Cup and what that means. Now, you fast forward to 2021, when we hosted the Arab Cup. People from different walks of life, Arabs from different, you know, living in Qatar, traveling to Qatar and so on, coming in. Um, it was a celebration. You know, people flocking into the stadium, celebrating, singing. You've got energy inside the stadium. You've got uh, people chanting, people happy, people sad, tears of joy and tears of sadness. Uh, but people congregated to the stadiums, maybe as opponents, left out as part of the family. I think at that time, it just showcased to the world what football really means to us, the power that it has, but more importantly also, we showcased to the world who we are. You know, as, as, as a nation, as the Arab nation, as Qatar, you know, we're hospitable. We welcome the world. We open our arms to the world for them to be able to come and see who we are and what, you know, and, and, and 
showcase ourselves in a way that only the World Cup in football can do, which is create that person-to-person -person relationship and break down stereotypes. And I think for us, for the Arab world, you know, the 2021 Arab Cup brought the Arab world to showcase and welcome the entire world in Qatar in 2022. And for a lot of people who might be the first time for them to come, I think it'll be a life-changing opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Edouard, tell us about your memories as a young boy when you watched uh, your first FIFA World Cup. And you will be playing for the first time in Qatar. And uh, you must be excited about uh, participating for the first time in the World Cup in November, December this year. Yes, I'm extremely excited about it. Uh, for Senegal, this will be the second uh, time in succession that it's particip uh, participated in the World Cup. And then for me, on a personal level, I've uh, always loved football, even from being very young. Uh, and it's uh, the World Cup uh, that uh, gave me the idea to become a football player, and it became my, my dream. Uh, and uh, the uh, World Cup in 1998, uh, in, during that World Cup, uh, I, I saw how happy it made people, uh, that it really did uh, federate, bring people together, how many, well, the, despite uh, skin color and uh, or religion, everybody was uh, uh, had their own flags, and everybody took advantage uh, and um, uh, took advantage of the pleasure that was generated by football. And then there were, was uh, 2002, where Senegal uh, had a wonderful wonderful uh, track record, and uh, that really gave me uh, the desire to play for my country and to do, you know, some great things. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, with uh, my career, mm. so I, I kind of put aside this idea of a uh, uh, World Cup for young people because uh, the World Cup became a bit more difficult. But anyway, I clung on to this idea, and I had the opportunity to play uh, in the World Cup. Uh, and uh, this was the World Cup uh, that uh, I saw as a fan, and now I can actually participate in, in it and uh, transmit those emotions uh, to uh, my fans. And if we look at Qatar and see everything that they've done to make this one of the best uh, World Cups, uh, I feel quite privileged uh, about this, because we'll be playing in these absolutely incredible stadiums. Uh, there'll be an incredible atmosphere. And also, uh, this, uh, well, in terms of proximity, this will be very practical for the fans and also for the team. So I hope uh, that we'll uh, come out of the pool with uh, Qatar, and uh, so we'll be very good friends forever. I, I'm looking forward to the drums, the drums of Senegal, the drums of Africa, and just the unique uh, excitement that Senegal, and, and of course Brazil as well, Brazil and Colombian, oh, Colombia is not there this year, how sad. But I'm looking forward to the Senegalese team uh, and, and the supporters making us proud. Uh, this is your last question because we're closing. There are some football clubs that has got a number of individual stars. Now, how do you convert these stars and combine them and unite them to become a very successful team and function as a, as a club and as a team together? Well, thank you for your nice question, Patrice. <laughs> That's a, a big subject, you know. But uh, overall, I must say, you explained to them that life is give and take. You know, the more you give, the more you take. And uh, as well, I would say that uh, when you're a manager, and you have a star in your team, for you he's not a star, he's a player. For the outside, he's a star. But he has a power in the team, in the dressing room. He influences other people. So when you are the best player on your side, he makes you stronger. When he is against you, in the dressing room, you will lose the battle, <laughs> you know. So that means, I would say, the, the secret is communication. You need to communicate with him because what we forget, a star is as well a guy who has more pressure than the other players. More is expected from him. So you have sometimes to calm him down and say, don't worry, produce your game. Don't you not have 
oh, they are not the only one who has to make the decision. And uh, so you have to treat him a little bit specially, but without giving him too much power. There's, he has to understand there's a level you are not ready to compromise anymore. And uh, people are like that. When they're at the top level, they want the power. And at some stage, you have to fight against that. And sometimes I had, in some moments of my career, put my job on the line by leaving the best player out because he was too strong and too demanding. And uh, then you have to not compromise and put the interest of the club above that. So it's a subtle game, yeah. but I would say the, the basic is respect, because you need to respect your players, love and communication. Yeah. Thank you. That's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I find it useful. We've got about uh, 120,000 employees in our companies, the companies where we are the, uh, the bigger shareholder. And you find some exceptionally bright leaders, executives. Some have been to the top universities in the world, but they cannot work with others. They think they've got all the answers and there's a lot of arrogance at times. And so you need to, so we can learn from what you said in football, because we need to get these world-class teams this guy from Harvard University and from top universities to work together with the rest of the team for the benefit of the club in terms of what you said, but also in our case, for the benefit of our companies. And I think the same applies in government as well, for the benefit of our countries. I'm gonna ask you the final question because we're going towards closure. Uh, football has a huge ecosystem. And uh, for, for those of us from the developing world, of course, we, you know, investment is crucial and, and these countries must be globally competitive. Uh, but, uh, but we've also identified the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a crucial part. And Hassan spoke about climate change and various others. How does, uh, in your capacity as president of FIFA uh, and leader of football worldwide, how does football contribute towards the realization and the fulfillment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Um, well, thank, th thanks as well for the question. Why you ask the football questions to them and the difficult ones uh, <laughs> about UN uh, matters <laughs> to me? <laughs> well, but in any case, we are, of course, uh, fully behind the UN SDGs. Uh, we are working a lot. And, and, and your question actually allows me to, to mention a couple of the projects that um, are very close to, uh, to my heart, to the hearts of many of the people here. The first one that I want to mention is linked with education, with uh, schools, with uh, a project we, that we call Football for Schools, which is a project in which we bring football to the schools. We don't want to teach students or kids to play football, but we want to use football as the hook uh, to educate children. Because uh, as Eduard was saying, as Phenomeno was saying, Jill, everyone, Football brings with it so many values, the team spirit, the teamwork. And with the excuse of football, you can speak about anything. You can speak about gender equality, about violence, about uh, discrimination, uh, about resilience in a way that children will listen to. So we are teaming up with UNESCO on this um, project. We launched it in several countries already, in India, in Mongolia, in Djibouti, in Mauritania, in Chile, in Lebanon, and we want to launch it in every country of the world, in France a couple of weeks ago, every country in the world which is interested. We are there because we want to contribute to one of the biggest challenges of society, we feel, which is the education of our children. Everything is linked with that. In addition to education, we invest, uh, and we have invested in the last uh, six years um, since I became president of FIFA, over 3 billion US dollars in uh, football projects in what we call the forward program. This is five times more than what was invested before. As of next year, we invest seven times more, not because we make seven times more revenues, but simply because the money goes where it has to go. It goes in building stadiums, pitches, infrastructure for boys and girls to play all over, um, all over the world. 
Um, we have put in place as well a COVID relief plan, one and a half billion US dollars to allow our federations to keep football alive. Not the top professional football, but the amateur football, the grassroots football, girls football, boys football, with, which has suffered a lot with the pandemic. I think the only sports federation who has done such a great project has been FIFA, and we can do that. Why? Because we've put our house in order. We've put our house in order because we want to regain the trust of the public, of the authorities, uh, concluding agreements with the African Union of, uh, uh, with President Kagame a couple of years ago, with the Council of Europe, with CARICOM, with Pacific Island Forum on Climate uh, and Environment Change. So many uh, projects which are important for um, our society and, uh, uh, you know, the, the American, the United States Department of Justice has just uh, remitted to FIFA uh, 201 million US dollars, which they had seized and confiscated from uh, corrupt FIFA officials in the past, for us to reinvest this money in football projects around the world because they have trust in us, in the new FIFA. And this is a very crucial uh, element um, for us, because only together, in partnership, we can uh, succeed. Let me please just say one final word, uh, since this is a session I didn't have the opportunity uh, about, also about this special session, look at this magic trophy over there, the World Cup. The only one who is allowed to touch it is this gentleman here, because he won it and myself, because I have to give it to those who win. <laughs> Nobody in the Amir, of course, because the heads of state, they can as well. <laughs> Nobody else can touch it. Uh, but let me just say that uh, this is a special year. We come out of the pandemic. We are in a divided world. We need excuses to bring people together. We have the best excuse with the World Cup. Come to Qatar from the 21st of November to the 18th of December. You will experience the experience of your life. The best World Cup ever not only from a football point of view, but also from ex an experience point of view, witnessing the Arab culture, the history, the welcoming way of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with those who will come. And uh, this will certainly contribute to, uh, well, maybe a little, little bit to making the world feel a little bit better. Absolutely. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you so much. We've come to the end. Uh, Your Highness, thank you so much for the wonderful work. And let's clap once more, give a warm applause to the members of the panel once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.